guest speaker. Today I'm very pleased to introduce Peter Kay AM, the National CEO of the Duke of Edinburgh International Awards Australia and Solomon Islands. Peter was appointed CEO in 2012, after 33 years, probably more than that, undertaking a range of volunteer governance roles for the awards nationally and internationally. In fact, I think it's probably more like over 40 years from what I'm speaking with you just now. Prior to taking, up the, uh, taking on the role uh, of CEO, Peter worked across a number of companies and mutual organisations, including Community First Credit Union. Peter will be speaking with us today on the legacy of His Royal Highness Prince Philip. 800,000 youth can't be wrong. But before Peter comes up and talks, I'd like to tell you a story about he came, how he came to meet with us today. As you know, we're doing a lot of research and looking at our club history in preparation for our club's 100 year anniversary in 2023. And part of the process has been to clear out the Kennard storage shed at Thurberton. Um, and our history committee, uh, Madeline and Reg, have been really busy down there sorting things out. And just after um, the 9th of April this year, which is the date the Duke of Edinburgh passed away at age 99, um, they found a certificate, which quite coincidentally, and Peter's going to show this, but I'll, I'll quickly show you. It says that the Rotary Club of Adelaide is a life member of the Friends of the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme in South Australia. And um, we saw this, this certificate because I work for the Department for Education, I'm in contact with the South Australian office of the Duke of Ed and I sent them a copy of that certificate and I said, what, what's all this about? And um, from there it got sent to Peter and Peter was coming over for the long weekend, the Queen's um, birthday long weekend here to Adelaide and said he would love to come and meet with our Rotary Club. Unbeknownst to Peter, <laughs> um, Sir Eric Newell, is connected to our club as well. So Sir, Sir Eric um, has had a very long history of service and support of the, award, of the awards in Australia and internationally, as has Lady Neil and Peter and James Neil. So it was a lovely surprise for Peter to have, have to find this other connection. Sir Eric was a former national chair of the awards between 1984 and 1992 and was responsible for encouraging Australians to join the World Fellows of the International Award Foundation. Sir Eric served as a trustee of the International Award Foundation between 1987 and 1997, and he was instrumental in securing the tax deductibility status of the awards. While he was Governor of South Australia, Sir Eric was patron of the award. And Sir Eric remains a strong public advocate of the award. And with Lady Neil, they have supported, sponsored and contributed to key events that have become milestones in the award's history. He and Lady Joan Neil, AM, are World Fellows of the Award and also Ambassadors of the Award. And I don't think I can um, uh, properly um, uh, explain actually the significance Sir Eric Neil has had on uh, the, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, not just here in Australia but internationally. Uh, Sir Eric was the first Australian to actually be on the international committee, and um, has yeah. And I'm sure Peter will speak a little bit more about that. So Sir Eric, we once again we're absolutely honoured, and it's beautiful <laughs> how things sort of come around. Um, and uh, lovely that you were able to be here today as well. So thank you. Thank you for all you've done. <laughs> okay, with that, I'd like us all to please welcome Peter Kay. Thank you.
done the hardest part has been mastered the technology. Um, good afternoon, Rotarians. Uh, it, it is a pleasure to be amongst you uh, uh, today. And, um, and again, I, I do um, uh, thank your president for the very, very warm welcome. And, and I also do acknowledge the Neil family um, uh, attendance today because, as um, Heidi explained, they have a very, very substantial contribution to the Duke of Ed. And I'll, and I'll um, uh, come to that in, in, in a moment. Um, and can I also recognise my uh, fellow alumni that were mentioned uh, uh, here? And it's not unusual now to go to a, a gathering of any type and you say, how many in the audience have completed Duke of Ed? And a bunch of hands go up. But then when you ask how many have children, nephews and nieces that have done the Duke of Ed? And it's just a sea, yeah, exactly, it's a sea of, it's a sea of, sea of hands. And that reflects where the Duke of Ed has come to uh, in Australia. We're one of 130 countries that deliver the uh, award at the moment. And um, of those countries in that, the last review, the Duke of Ed operates on a social franchise model. It's licensed uh, through the trustees that Heidi referred to, that Zurich was a, a, an international trustee. The trustees license a country to deliver the award. And uh, it's a very, very tightly managed uh, license arrangement. And um, at the last reissue of licences, Australia was named the lighthouse country of the Duke of Edinburgh's Award internationally. And um, so not only are we delivering, we're delivering it very, very, very well. Um, we're the only country in the world where the Duke of Ed is being delivered uh, in a self-funding manner. So every dollar received by way of a donation to the Duke of Ed 100% goes to the front line to support disadvantaged young people. And that's also a first in the world. So we're very proud of what we're delivering. So what is it that we're delivering? Some of you have got an idea because you've done it. You've got friends, family, and whatever that we're delivering. Uh, the fascinating part about Prince Philip's legacy is in keeping with a man's character, he created a program that's got nothing in it. He delivered a bottle without any fluid a box that's empty. He, he delivered a framework, a four-part framework that is activity-free, curriculum-free. So if Prince Philip and Kurt Hahn, who was the educationalist brains behind it, and Lord Hunt of the Mount Everest fame, if they were in this room now designing the Duke of Ed program, Prince Philip would be saying, right, let's just make sure we've got this clear. We're going to design this in open architecture. So if you're into you know, digital coding and concept stage, it has to be fluid, dynamic, can't be locked in. And they did that in 1956. In 1956, it was curriculum, it was rote, it was prescriptive. And here he was designing something that would be fluid and adaptable, regardless of culture, location, type of young person anywhere. So he designed a tool, not a finished product. And that tool is the Duke of Ed. It's a framework that's empty of activity. Young people are challenged to do four things. And those four things are up to those young people and their adult volunteers, their mentors. Now you're probably ahead of me, you know what the four things are. Adventurous journey, a team challenge. Physical recreation, sweat, get healthy. A, a skill, a life skill, extend your hobbies, your interests. And the fourth one, give. Volunteer, give to your community. They are, that's the four-part framework. And Prince Philip created this framework and handed it over to youth leaders, to teachers, to educationalists, to implement as they saw fit. I'm going to pause here and show you a video. The video has seven young people talking about their Duke of Bed experience. The significance of this video is that each one of these young people is what you'd call have had a challenging road in life. Some of them are very obvious when you see them, that what their challenges may be. Others are less obvious, but each one is a, is a young person that would have ended up possibly in a very difficult uh, situation um, in terms of their lives. And um, uh, one of them, and I'd like to ask you at the end of which one you think it might be. 
one of them was actually um, announced a year and a half ago by the Australian Financial Review as one of Australia's top 100 influential people. And that person was a nobody before they did the Duke of Ed Award. So have a look at this video and I'll come back to you. And I've um, pressed nothing's happened. So that's all right. I was always a very, very active kid, very loud, very uh, extroverted. You know, I was never the most social person, I was quite often just like the creepy one. Trying to, I guess, associate with my peers was very difficult. Me at 13 was very scared of the world. I didn't do much sport, not because I didn't want to, uh, but because I, I actually didn't have the confidence to uh, go out and do that. As a child with a disability, I would always feel like I was watching from the apps to birds. I, like, I had low self-esteem. I didn't think that I could accomplish a lot of things, even though like I did have big dreams, but it was always a fantasy and not a reality. I was a little naive. Um, in high school at 12 and 13, you know, that was my little world, my little shell. When I first um, mentioned that I wanted to do the Duke of Little World, um, people tell me it's too hard. It's not meant to be for someone with a disability. At first, I wasn't 100% sure about it. <laughs> Um, it did feel quite um, awkward. Initially, I was uh, a little bit pushed into it by my, uh, by my parents, but as I went on, it became more intrinsic motivation. I kind of made a resolution to myself that I'd at least try to do new things and to try and um, work on myself. I was like, I'll just go to the meeting, see what happens. And because of me going to every meeting, I'm like, might as well just do it. You know, I was told that there's these four main aspects, the volunteering aspect, um, a, a skill aspect, a sports aspect, and an adventurous journey. I went on a 10 day cruise to um, New Caledonia. That was, I guess, the most first taste of uh, independent living without my family. What I did at the time was rugby union, so it was pretty full on. Um, I guess my home was sort of my, my little safe spot where I could retreat into, but trying to appeal outside of that was, was very difficult. I went out and I started running. Um, I hadn't done sports before, so for me, even that was a big deal, getting involved in cross-country competitively. Initially, I wasn't really keen on the idea of going to an aged care home because I was really freaked out by old people. I didn't know how I'd hold a conversation with someone who wasn't sort of at my age, basically. I went to school, I was like, oh, guys, like I'm going to Canberra, I'm going hiking, it's going to be awesome. And they're like, Oh, what's this for? I was like, Duke of Edinburgh, and they're like, I don't like camping. The guy that was with us, he was like showing us all these mountains because it was out of Hobbs right? And he's like, oh, you're going to hike up there. And I was like, what? I'm going to hike up there? We basically had like false peak after false peak. And I could feel like my fitness, my, my muscles just failing on me. And um, I had this massive bag and no one else could carry it for me because everyone else had their own luggage. I had a very narrow point of view and I never thought that I would get so much back out of just going to visit an old person. After the experience, um, little things didn't matter anymore. Pushing yourself when you're a teenager, those sorts of things will give you the resilience when you're older to sit there and be like, I don't care that my boss is, is mean to me. I don't care because, you know, I've gone through challenges like this that make you look at your life and be like, I can do this. I was fortunate to find a lot of mentors along the way who so many for who I am. I did a lot of things during that award that I, at 13, did not think I was able to do. Despite sort of what I was going, what I was facing with my autism, but I did have the capabilities to really go above my limitations. I like to think I'm more self-aware now. I saw my confidence just shoot up. Now it's more about how I see the world and not how the world sees me. Life can take in so many different paths, but only if you let it. Okay, which one of those um, young people was named in the top 100 influential Australians? Hard to tell? It is, isn't it? It was actually um, Mel, the one in the wheelchair. Yeah, so she went from being a taker, stuck at home, always looked after, to being a giver. She now runs two companies. She's a TEDx speaker. And the Pin Review named her as 
in, 19, in, in um, 2019, and Vera is one of Australia's 100 most influential women. So they better reflect what we're on about. Now, we're on about giving young people the opportunity to challenge. What was designed by Prince Philip was a, a tool that in the hands of a, of a motivated uh, educationalist, youth worker, works with young people and takes them to personal best. I've often said to people, Prince Charles did not fail the Duke of Egg. He just never completed. <laughs> right? You, you cannot fail the award. You, you do the activities, you set goals, you regularly get involved, you log, you work with your mentor, and you complete, you achieve. There is no failure. So my son didn't fail, he just was a guy, a bloke, he never logged. I think he's done his award three times over, but anyone that's got boys would appreciate they're just not into the regular discipline and there's no way I was going to do it for him. So um, what we have now, and we have about 800,000 young Australians who, who participated in the program, and, and it's a program that you don't see. We have no uniforms, we have no, no, no um, buildings. You can't join the award. You do it, and you do it through other organisations. One of my favourite stories when I was a, a bit younger involved with the award, I used to describe it as a parasite. It needed, it needed a host to, to, to live off. And I remember one time uh, in, a, in a, uh, a conference and I, and I used the parasite analogy and Prince Philip came up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, I wish you'd change your um, example. You know, it's a, it's a good parasite, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Describing the award as a parasite is not a good example. So um, I had to drop it since, but I'm now mentioning it in his memory. Um, so, so that, that's what the award is all about. It, it, is a, a pro, it is a series of individual programs. So if you all did the award, you would all have a variation to your own program. It's not a set curriculum. Why does it work so well? Okay, we, we can have four, four people, uh, two people who are, and I'll give this quick example. We have two people that are cellmates. And then the education officer comes along and says, we're introducing the Duke of Ed into this juvenile justice centre. One says, I'm in. The other one says, nah. Nah, not interested. But the one that's not interested is best mates the one that says, I'm in. So they both do the same activities. No, I'm going to stereotype prison. They, they both do woodworking and they make toys, which they donate to a charity. Uh, they're both involved in the kitchen garden in the prison and growing vegetables, so that's a skill. Um, they um, both do upper body strengthening in the gym. Uh, and they qualify to do a team challenge in the outer yard of the prison, including sleeping overnight, cooking their own meals. Okay, fact. They're now both released from prison. They're out in the community. The one that hasn't done the Duke of Ed, they've both done the same activities for the same duration. Fact. Sample, 20,000 juvenile young people have been in the prison system. What is the recidivism rate for the one that hasn't done the Duke of Ed? Internationally, someone will throw a number at me. What are the chances, percentage chances of them returning to prison? Uh, you're much higher than the system. Um, I wouldn't want to live where you're living. Um, <laughs> but if you are living in, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, think around 60, 65%. If you're living in um, Asia, um, South Africa, think about 80, 85%. Okay, I'll avoid you. Um, okay. What about the one that did all those activities for the Duke of Ed? Sorry? Yeah, 8.5. Okay. So, now we all know the ad. Same age, same occupation. <laughs> right? You know what we're talking about here? Well, it, <laughs> that's right. Okay. It is exactly the same. So, the Duke of Ed is much more than the activities the young people do. They're important. But the fact is, they choose activities deliberately. They choose a goal. They do it regularly, absolute minimum six months, typically 14 months. To get to the gold, typically two, two and a half years. Weekly engagement. And subject matter experts, mentors for each activity. Life-forming habit behavioural changes. Now, I went to Royla. I'm a Royla graduate. Thank you, Rotarians. Okay? Now, I loved it. I learned a lot, got some skills, whatever. But I tell you what, three months later, four months later, it had sort of quite disappeared. <laughs> right? I've retained some things, but 
the impact when I left was high and then it disappears. So the Duke of Ed is not hot housing. The Duke of Ed is in the community over years. You get positive behaviour changes. And, and we have massive research now that backs that up. So that's when we talk about the Duke of Ed, it is something a lot broader and a lot more complex than what we first you know, uh, realised it is. Okay, some statistics. How many volunteers does it take to run the Duke of Ed in Australia? Over here, any guesses? Okay, this might help you. I've got a, got a prize. <laughs> Sorry, 100 volunteers? Okay. Okay. Uh, so if, if you're thinking less than 1,000, you owe me a prize. We've got 20,000. We've got 20,000. I hear more. 20,000. 20,000 on this table here. We've got 20,000. Do I have 30? Do I have 30? Oh, come on. I want to give it away. Sorry. Who said, who was that ridiculous 80,000? No, 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 it's not. Okay, I don't want you to go away thinking 62,000. In Australia, 62,000 volunteers to run the Duke of Ed in Australia. Okay? We have 40,000 young people active. So it shows the intensity of support that's required. So if we, if we were a Dinkum Donuts outlet franchise, we would have 62,000 casual staff. We would have 45,000 regular daily wholesale customers and we would have 3,000 locations. And how many staff do we have to run all that in Australia? Mm -hmm. Okay, a bit of inducement, you work well with inducement. I hear 100, I hear 100. I hear eight. I'm impressed. Oh, I don't want to work for you. <laughs> oh, 60,000 volunteers, 45,000 uh, young people, uh, 3,000 locations, eight, 10? Okay. Did I hear? Okay. Come and get your prize. You're close enough. I'll be here all day. Um, 37 full time equivalent. Okay. So it gives you an idea that this, this, this um, gigabed is um, very substantial and it introduces massive amounts of social capital in, into our community. So it's not only the young people that benefit out of it. Um, you know, we refer to it as a youth program, but we have far more adults. You know, we're a major adult volunteer program. So, um, and for every young person that, that, that goes through the award, we know directly from our research about eight to 10 other young people or family members have been positively influenced. Right? So it's a very substantial contribution uh, to, um, to social capital. So. It's growing. What is our challenge? Our challenge is we can't keep up with locations. We can't keep up with the volunteers and the trained award leaders that are required. So demand is exceeding supply. And we are amongst now a process of changing our delivery model to try and cater for it. We start about 30,000 young people a year and our goal in five years to start 75 and in 10 years to be starting 250,000 a year. We, we want to mainstream it. We will mainstream it. And that's why we changed our model to become financially self-funding, so we're not held back by donations or you know, we, we can grow and self-fund our operations. So we're quite an unusual, unique operation. And um, so a bit of a sales pitch. You're all busting to ask me, how can we get involved? Right. Now, if you've got a business card or you want to pinch one of mine uh, before you leave, all of you can become Duke of Ed employers. A Duke of Ed employer is simply somebody, no money involved, somebody, an organisation employer, who puts on their website that we recognise Duke of Ed applicants. Don't promise anything, you're, just, you're asking the question at the point of recruitment, do you have a Duke of Ed? Right? You don't have to promise an interview or promise anything. That's, that's the first way you can get involved. Second way, we have a um, pay forward program, a regular giving program, $20 a month. We ask for a two year commitment and that will fund a disadvantaged young person to complete the Duke of Ed. So you become an award friend. So if you have any interest about that, come, come and see me. And um, 
I am going to ask a couple of questions and give you another couple of prizes, but I want to take them home for the weight issues. So, um, okay. So, um, your president mentioned that Sir Rick O'Neill was an uh, international trustee, an Australian international trustee. He was one of how many trustees from Australia? Any idea? Who said three? Close enough. Okay. Uh, Ever Australian trustees. And amongst you, you have two very important alumni. First one to give out, read out their name, Duke of Ed, Gold Award alumni. Who said Kate? Okay, excellent. Okay, that, that was hard on the table, wasn't it? Okay. And I'm going to let two tote bags of Duke of Ed Okay, now the, the, um, the, 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 the final um, uh, uh, one is, um, and I'm going to again finish off on, on, on our special guest, we have a Duke of Ed umbrella, multicolored, is it um, there to unfold it? Uh, anyway, um, you know what? This is not a Duke of Ed umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an umbrella by the company that makes the Duke of Ed umbrellas that gave it to us as a prize. Um, <laughs> so... I will put this away, <laughs> or someone can have it if it's raining outside. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is terrible. I've got to look at my things. I will give this to your president to, um, to do what they will with. But um, thanks very much for having me as your guest. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share with you a little bit of information about the Duke of Ed and, and hopefully broaden your understanding about this amazing, very, very effective program that we're lucky to have uh, in our communities throughout Australia. And thank you for the work that you do as Rotarians. Thank you so much, Peter. I think we have an opportunity for one question. Is that all right, Trevor? Okay, before we close. So, um, a question, please. Albert Ben Simon. What's the age group of uh, people able to enter yeah, into sure. the award? And I can tell you're asking for yourself. So I'll, 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 I'll be kind, a little, a little bit younger than you, just a little bit. Uh, it's year nine, so 14 to 25. So it covers deliberately the post high school. So uh, 13, 14, they can start the award and they must have logged by the time they're 25. So it's quite a broad um, teenage into university span. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, any other burning questions? At the moment, no. Oh, all right. Quick. Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, look, uh, the, the short answer is yes, it is schools, probably as high as about 80%. And then you've got everything, PCYC, surf life-saving clubs, you've got um, local government, uh, Adelaide Zoo, opposite Duke of Ed. So, yeah, you, the mind just goes crazy after that. Juvenile justice centres, um, but the main access point for most young people is through their high school. All right. So, thank you very much, Peter. It's been an absolute pleasure and really wonderful that you've been able to be here today. Um, lovely to have you here as well, Sir Eric, Peter and James as well. So involved in the Duke of Ed. We've got, and obviously we are friends of the Duke of Edinburgh Award, our club. And um, I reckon, you know, we might be able to look at another way to keep keep the, the tradition going within. The yes, that's right, exactly. So, um, Peter, on behalf of members of the club, I'd like to present you with a certificate of appreciation um, for addressing our lunch meeting today and a donation will be made on your behalf to our Rotary Club of Adelaide Community and Youth Projects. So, Terrific. thank you so much. Rotarians and guests, please stand and say thank you to Peter. Thank you. And, um, and certainly my involvement with the Duke of Ed uh, through the Department of Education has really just been a bit of an advocate for it because I'm a, a, a great believer in young people volunteering and in particular those who are most disengaged to be, to be able to 
but to be given those opportunities and to actually be recognised for some of the amazing things that they do through the Duke of Ed has certainly had a, a huge impact on a number of our uh, flow students here in Adelaide, our flexible learning um, option students who are our most disengaged young people. So, wonderful programs.